You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin. And guys... I am so freaking excited for this episode today. The planning for this episode actually began three months ago before the holiday break, and I have just been dying from excitement since then. Many of you may remember the episode that I did on Pam Hupp, the Pam Hupp case. If you are not familiar, before you actually continue with this episode, please go back. I did a five episode series on it. If any of you are interested, let me know. I'm thinking about putting all of them together into one long episode so that it tells the entire story in one place, because that entire case is insanity. And there is actually a TV series coming out on NBC on March 8th titled The Thing About Pam. Now, for those of you who are not familiar and don't have time, want to listen to the episode, but don't have time to go back, which please do listen to it. It's a really, really deep case. The gist is this. There was a man named Russ Faria. He was married to Betsy for many years. Russ went out one night, hung out with friends, came home and discovered his wife Betsy brutally murdered. He thought initially, because she was wearing darker clothes, that she had actually committed suicide. He called the police. Um, I played the 911 call in that previous episode. And suffice it to say, it didn't end up how he thought it would. Uh, Russ actually was charged with his wife's murder. He went on trial for stabbing her over 55 times and was convicted. Russ Faria spent almost four years in prison, but his attorney, Joel Schwartz, never gave up on him. He truly, truly believed that Russ Faria was innocent. So Joel, along with an investigative reporter in St. Louis, actually did some digging into Pam Hupp. Pam Hupp was Betsy Faria's best friend. She had made some conflicting statements, outright lies in the initial investigation, and she had some shady deals on the site as well. What happened is that Russ Faria actually had his conviction overturned. It went to a retrial and it was actually overturned. Russ Faria is now a free man. What did happen, though, is that the investigation into Pam Hupp uncovered a lot of insane things. Not only that, but she actually attempted to frame Russ Faria by setting up a mentally disabled man, acting like Russ Faria was dispatching people to come kill her in revenge. This story is wild. Pam Hupp ended up being arrested as she was in the police station being questioned. She actually grabbed a pen and attempted to stab herself in the neck, which she was successful at. As it stands right now, Pam Hupp is awaiting trial, but the entire story is just so batshit insane that NBC actually picked it up. Renee Zellweger is actually going to play Pam Hupp, and uh, Josh Duhamel is actually going to play Joel Schwartz, Russ Faria's attorney. Joel's book on the entire experience has actually just dropped. It's called Bone Deep. And I'm just going to go ahead and let Joel in his own words discuss his experience, some behind the scenes stuff. But guys, you know me, you know that I do not endorse or discuss books, films, anything like that, unless I 100% solely believe in it and get behind it. You can read his account and his experience with Russ Faria, Pam Hupp, all of it. And then on March 8th, which is coming up in what, like two weeks, you can actually do the two and a half weeks. You can actually watch the thing about Pam on NBC and you'll be fully caught up. And while you're in there, listen to the series that uh, I did here on We Saw the Devil about that entire murder from Betsy Faria to Louis Gumpenberger. Pam Hupp even may have killed her own mother, guys. In fact, it's it's looking pretty likely. It's an absolutely wild story. So after some really quick housekeeping, guys, I'm going to go ahead and air the interview. 
To get the housekeeping out of the way, you are listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. Don't forget, our website is www.wesawthedevil.com. From there, you can find all of our social media channels, uh, as well as our Patreon, where for as little as $3 a month, you can financially back the show and get some cool stuff while doing it. That's it for the intro, guys. Again, sorry for the refresher, but I feel like this episode particularly needs it. If you're not familiar with the Pam Hupp case, take a minute, go down that rabbit hole, read about it, listen to our previous episodes on it, and then circle back and listen to this interview with Joel Schwartz so you can get the proper context. I'm going to go ahead and air the interview with Joel now. So Joel, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I've been looking so forward to speaking with you because I, along with so many other people, we've been horrified, disgusted. And I think simultaneously fascinated by the Russ Faria trial as a whole, but then also now the figure of Pam Hupp that has crawled out of the the bowels of this. Well, thank you so much, Robin. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you and uh, your listeners. I understand the fascination with it. I still to this day am somewhat fascinated uh, in the dumpster fire fashion of Pam Hupp. Not only Pam Hupp, but everything that went along with this case and the detectives and the prosecutor's inability to remotely see through her and the facade that she had attempted so poorly to create. And I appreciate I'm I'm really excited to discuss these things with you. I think for me, my biggest interest in this case is the prosecutorial misconduct as a whole. That's actually what just completely disturbed me from the very beginning of this case. So we can get into that as well. I would love to pick your brain on a few of these things because you lived it. Uh, it was uh, one of the most frustrating episodes of being a lawyer that I, not only that I had ever encountered in 33 years, but that I've ever heard of any other attorney encountering, not only because the injustices that were occurring, but because the stakes were simply so high mm-hmm. and it was just so painfully obvious as to, at least to me, and my seventh grade son as to who was behind this and who would have been responsible. Let's start with your book, Bone Deep. Where did the name come from? The name comes from when Russ first encountered the body of his wife laying on the carpet when he walked inside. The only visible wounds were some scratches on her arms and a cut in her wrist where it appeared it was all the way to the bone, but it almost appeared as if somebody post-mortem attempted to cut her hand off Mm. for reasons that I still couldn't even begin to guess to today. So that cut was clearly bone deep as well as the knife that was protruding from her neck was all the way through and all the way to the bone, hence the name bone deep. That's quite a title. It is. And, uh, Hopefully, it uh, at least encaptures or encapsulates a little bit of what's in the book. There is too much and there's too many areas specifically. Mm -hmm. Coming up with a name was very difficult, and we really didn't want it to be about Pam Hub. Mm -hmm. We wanted it to be about Russ and myself and the ordeal that we endured to get to where we are today. No, and I think that's absolutely incredible because Pam Hupp really has become a figurehead, but I think that people really need to take a step back and examine what Russ Faria has gone through. I mean, this case is really one of the most unique ones that I've ever heard of in the legal system, ever, in my lifetime. There are supposed to be stop gaps within the system, Mm -hmm. and they generally work somewhere along the line. And what I mean by that is you've got a team of investigators looking at something so serious. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they had what's called the the major case squad was called out to investigate this crime. So two of them were assigned to go interview Pam Hupp, who they were told was one of Bessie Faria's best friends. The first interview was approximately three and a half hours. And one of the very first things she said when asked was she lied about initially going into the house. Mm -hmm. Well, the interview was fraught with lie after lie after lie over the course of three and a half hours, um, at which time they also learned that Pam became the beneficiary four days earlier Mm -hmm. of the life insurance or Betsy's, the proceeds of Betsy's life insurance. So given the fact that she lied about going in the house, she lied about where she was when she called Betsy, and those were all easily provable, not only did she lie about it, but her story changed and I don't mean it changed over the course of several interviews or several weeks or several years. Her story changed within the in- initial interview itself. Mm-hmm. That coupled with the fact that she was the last one with her, that she had 
imputed herself into Betsy's life, essentially forced herself on Betsy the day before, after text had said, no, I want to spend one-on-one time with this other individual and Pam still showed up, coupled with the fact that she got the life insurance proceeds, at least, at the very, very least, would warrant some form or fashion of investigation. Right. You take that coupled with the fact that while Russ Faria was in custody, he not only told them where his whereabouts were and what he did the entirety of the evening, they went and they confirmed on videotape three of the locations that had videotape. They confirmed the fourth by uh, identification and a receipt and went and they interviewed his four alibi witnesses separately. They did that three times, took him to separate police stations. Uh, they were all entirely credible. And they found a receipt from when he was leaving the area of his alibi crumpled up in the back of his car from Arby's. Given those two sort of diametrically opposed individuals, you would think at the very least, we take a look at this other person who got the money. As we say in this business all the time, and they say on every TV episode, follow the money is probably going to lead you to the answer. In this case, if they were able to follow the money and eliminate Pam Huck as a suspect, so be it. But given the fact that it would have been virtually impossible based on their initial investigation for Russ Faria to have somehow committed this crime, it still perplexes me a decade later as to why they didn't look elsewhere. And that's what I've never understood. And I've, I've played it back through my own head a million times going through. I've been obsessed with this case for, for a couple years now. Is you, you and I both probably know the statistics here, Joel. Like somewhere roughly around one out of every five murder victims are murdered by an intimate partner, right? So there's a reason yes. why there are t-shirts that say the husband did it you know, things like that. But in this case, what I found so immediately horrifying is he was caught on CCTV in multiple locations. There were multiple receipts. And then he had four friends who he had been hanging out with that evening that provided an alibi for him. Um, Like you said, credible witnesses. Now, one of my big questions is Leah Askey, the prosecutor in this case, which I believe she's now uh, Leah Cheney. She she changed her name when she was running for re-election due to the widespread publicity and negative publicity regarding this case. It didn't help. She still was trounced. And I don't want to say a figure that's wrong, but I believe her opponent, Mike Wood, got 88% of the vote. And that's unheard of for an incumbent to lose like that. Good for her. (laughs) Yes. Wonderful for her. Why do you think, and I believe that she was also having a sexual relationship with someone out of the the sheriff's department, right? Um, Who was on the investigative team for this case as well. After the case had concluded, I received a letter allegedly from one of the investigating officers to Leah Askey, professing love, talking about the relationship. And I did use that in my Mooney motion. However, I chose not to make my motion ultimately about the sexual affair, Mm -hmm. the alleged sexual affair. Uh, And I really don't go into it in the book only because I didn't want it to be about that when it didn't really make any difference because every other error and everything else that was done uh, by the prosecutor was so wrong and so just off the beaten path that I just left it to the hard facts because I knew they would both deny that an affair occurred. And in fact, they did deny it. At what point, as you are representing Russ, did you realize that something sinister on the side of the prosecutor was happening? And there had to have been a point where you realized this isn't normal. You you never experienced this kind of conduct before. No, and I don't know that any defense attorneys have, but it uh, it sort of grew and it grew slowly. I thought when I first got hired by Russ, his story was just too good. And I don't mean that it was too good to be true. It was just so easily so easily unraveled if he if it wasn't true. So he told me about his alibi on our first meeting. He told me what he did. He told me about the relationship and everything that he told me. I could either verify or disprove within the matter of about a day. Mm-hmm. So I was easy to it, w- it was simple to confirm the things he had told me, and based upon that, and then the information I was hearing about Pam Hupp at the time and the insurance proceeds. I really believed within a matter of months, and we're talking now early 2012, I would sit down with the prosecutor. I didn't know her at the time. She would be reasonable. We'd sit down, we'd hash this out, and the charges would be dismissed Mm -hmm. because it was so painfully clear at that point in time that Russ didn't do it. And I was looking at these officers wondering how they brought this to the prosecutor and why they brought this to the prosecutor. And essentially, they did everything wrong. What you're not, what you're taught not to do. They made a decision 
And then they try to confirm that decision, what they call confirmation bias, and fit that square peg into a tiny little round hole, and it was never going to fit. Mm-hmm. That's your first stopgap that I kind of talked about earlier. Yep. There was not a detective in the room that ever stepped back and said, hey, wait a minute, why don't we take a look? He, his alibi is too good. He didn't have any blood on him. He's denying any responsibility. How could he have done this, and when could he have done it? Instead of stepping back and saying that, they did the reverse. They said, we know he did it. We just yeah. need to figure out how he did it and why he did it, because we can't. So they then took their case to the prosecutor, who should then say to them, no, 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 guys, we don't have enough here. Take it back and look some more. Look at all the potential circumstances. Look at all the potential suspects. That never happened. Not only did the police double down, the prosecutor doubled down. Mm-hmm. And so when you refer to ethical requirements, I didn't know searches had occurred. I didn't know interviews had occurred. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know anything about some photos that were never turned over that were lied about on the stand during the first trial. So all those things coupled with the fact that I had a judge who had never handled a murder trial, and I'm sorry to say, couldn't have possibly been more inept, reduced us and and got them past what I would call the third stopgap, which is the judge. Unfortunately, when we got to the trial, I presented all the evidence of his alibi. I did what I could in his defense, but I was not allowed to because of these faulty rulings mm-hmm. to cross-examine Pam Hupp, cross-examine what they term legally as her prior inconsistent statements that the general layman would simply call a lie, mm-hmm. flat out lie. And nor was I able to let the jury hear anything about the insurance and that she had some sus- somehow suspiciously and mysteriously had her policy converted over to Pam Hupp approximately four days before she was brutally murdered. So a jury did not ever hear about those things, even without hearing about those, we still had a very, very solid defense. That's your final stock gap is the jury. Mm -hmm. And they were unable to see through the prosecutor's shenanigans, the prosecutor's mischaracterization of the facts, and the most irresponsible closing argument that I have ever seen in 33 years of doing this. And they convicted Resferia. It's absolutely terrifying, especially when you think about it on a more personal level, right? You know, Russ Freya went out that evening. He went out to a friend's house. He came home, found his wife brutally murdered, and then suddenly he's convicted. He was set to die in prison. Fortunately, the final stopgap, or the second to final stopgap, is the Court of Appeals. And with the information that they had in front of it and the all the information that I had put on the record, on the transcript outside the presence of the jury, the Court of Appeals had become aware of. And then lo and behold, I got some new information regarding the affair you spoke of and regarding Pam Hupp's shenanigans again with money, uh, regarding a trust that she had set up. And I filed what I had never heard of up till the time called a Mooney motion. Uh, And that is evidence that's so egregious that had a jury heard heard that evidence, it would have been more likely than not that they had come back with a different verdict. And based upon that motion, The court sent it back for a new trial and never actually even heard the appeal itself. This is this case was the third time in the 200 plus years of the state of Missouri's existence that that has ever been granted. Thank goodness for that. Well, which tells you how ridiculous this conviction and this presentation by Leah Askey was. Now, question for you, if you don't mind, just backing up one moment. A big question that I've had as well is the blood that was found on the scene. I know that the pictures and whatnot taken of it, it was very clear that it was placed there. I think uh, from what I've read in several interviews, it was very clear that the blood evidence, say like on the light switch and the wall and the slippers and whatnot, that it had been meticulously tampered with and placed there. It looked staged. So what you're referring to is this. uh, There was blood on what they call a light switch plate going back to the closet of Russ and Betsy Faria. More importantly, there was a pair of his slippers Mm -hmm. that had blood on them. And the judge and the prosecutor kept using that to call it a direct connection to Russ. To me, it was, again, painfully obvious to a layman, to an attorney, to anybody, as you stated, that it had been painstakingly uh, staged. Someone took those shoes, swiped them in the blood, walked back and used them to turn on the light switch, and then planted them in the kind of deep recesses of the closet, closet for the police to find. And the reason we know that, uh, and there's a picture of the slippers in bone deep, there is blood kind of a little bit on the side of the shoes and just a little bit on the bottom. If somebody was wearing those shoes when they stabbed Betsy 56 times, 
it would be blood all over the top of the shoes in, in a pattern, uh, what they call blood spatter. If somebody was wearing those and stepped in the blood, it was a ridged bottom. The entire bottom of the shoes would be covered in blood uniformly on, on either shoe. That didn't exist. What also didn't exist in this big, large pool of blood was there was not a footprint. Finally, the blood was in the middle of a carpet where it had pooled, and there was not a bloody footprint on the carpet surrounding the blood, which again would be impossible if somebody was stepping in the blood to get it on the bottom of the shoes, as is depicted in the photographs, at least to a, to a small degree. Clearly, it's facts like that that would indicate somebody took the blood, took the shoes and swiped them in the blood to make it look like Russ did it. And things like that should take the police, at least one intelligent officer, which we apparently didn't have, and say, wait a minute, why would he swipe his own shoes in the blood? That makes no sense. Similar to what I think led them to believe it was Russ in the first place. When Russ arrived home, he called in and said, my wife killed herself. Mm -hmm. My wife committed suicide. And I think he said it three times, maybe even a fourth. Well, if you think of, think it through, the person who did this is clearly not going to attempt to persuade the police that that's what he thinks happened, given that there are 56 wounds, most of which in the back and most of which are post-mortem. Yeah. The person who did it is not going to call in suicide, contrary to what the police initially believed. The reason he called him suicide is because several reasons. Number one, he walked in, he saw the large, she, he saw some slashes on her arms and the large slash of her wrist. Mm -hmm. He saw a knife left in her neck, thinking she may have done that herself, but she was wearing dark clothing and the large majority of the wounds were underneath that clothing and she simply couldn't see those. So again, him calling in there made sense. What they didn't take the time to do was look into her history and she had not only attempted suicide in his presence, but she had been involuntarily hospitalized by a patrolman one day for running a stop sign because she said she felt like killing herself. So given all those and the fact that she had attempted, that she had just recently been diagnosed with terminal cancer, led him to what I would think is certainly a plausible and reasonable conclusion when he called it in. Absolutely. Again, nobody ever stepped back and thought, okay, that makes sense. Do you think that this case is just the perfect storm of ineptitude, corruption? Wh why do you think Russ Faria was failed on almost every single level from the initial investigation the very night that Betsy had been murdered to all of it, the, the legal system, everything failed him? It did fail him. And I hate that I was part of that system, even though I was fighting against it. Um, the prosecutor argued that those alibi witnesses were part of it. She argued that he stopped at these places and got himself on camera as part of his alibi. And again, they just failed to consider when he stopped to get gas and he's on the camera, he gets out, he pumps about 10 bucks of gas and gets back in the vehicle. He doesn't know that there's a camera there and doesn't know that things, things are working. So when you say a perfect storm of ineptitude and corruption, I don't know that I could say it any better than myself because nobody ever thought through any of these things here. He stopped after he left his friends at an Arby's to get some dinner because he hadn't eaten. While the Arby's receipt shows 909. The cops then took that time and he called in at uh, 911 at I think it was 940 and 42 seconds or 941, something like that. So it took him 32 minutes to drive home. So the cops would go and they did this three times. They'd go to the Arby's station and they'd turn on a camera and they'd turn on a timer and they would take off like a bat out of hell. And they would attempt to show that he could get, could have gotten back there in 24 minutes. And they were able to do that. Well, they were able to do it because they were going on, the, they were passing on the right, they were going on the shoulder. They were doing all those sorts of things in an attempt to fit that square peg into the round hole, like I described about. Yeah. The one thing they never considered is, and I did, is I checked with the clock that they utilized at the, at the station. They used the wrong one. And the clock at the station was actually two minutes faster, which would have, or three minutes, which was eliminated three minutes. And your receipt comes out the time you order, not the time you receive your food in the drive through So with all their efforts, they would never sit back and nobody ever looked at the minute details of this to say, okay, you know what? It actually is impossible to have gotten back home and done this. Notwithstanding that, they wanted to argue that he somehow did this without getting a speck of blood on any of his clothing because we knew from the videos that he was captured on that he was wearing the identical clothing right down to his shoes and a hat that he was wearing throughout the entire evening. So I, to call it corruption, uh, in some instances, that's unfair. 
and aptitude is clearly uh, appropriate. But as the case progressed, it became more and more corrupt. Mm -hmm. Uh, They just wanted to win. They wanted to prove they were right. They were right. And justice took a seat so far on the back that it uh, was like a caboose and a 10 mile long train. And the only one attempting to seek justice was me. And ultimately, I think all these people would regret having done what they did, but not because they're sorry about it, but because they've gotten caught. Now, at what point uh, when he was convicted, did you just know automatically that I'm going to fight for this man regardless of what it takes? Like, I'm here for the long haul. Uh, Within two seconds after the jury said guilty, the judge said, uh, why don't we go ahead and set a date for sentencing right now? And I rather snidely said, why don't we go ahead and set a new tra- a date for the new trial right now while we're at it? Um, and she just looked at me and didn't say a word. And then I walked outside of the TV cameras and I said, I guarantee you, we will be back here with a new trial. And it didn't matter what it took. I wasn't going to quit. I didn't know we'd get back so soon. I can't say, especially because I never even heard of a Mooney motion at that time, that we'd get back there on the Mooney motion. But I am thrilled for myself and for us that we did. Well, thank you. Thank you for not. I know that a lot of attorneys and whatnot have abandoned, you know, abandoned clients or didn't really have the confidence level that things would go their way or didn't want to go through the appeals process. So thank you for for sticking by Russ. Well, what I can say is also that Russ stuck by me. Remember, a lot of people will fire their lawyer. Yep. I, I, you know, I, I took an innocent guy to trial and I lost and, and knew he was innocent. He knew he was innocent. Now, Russ will tell you, and he, as he's told in numerous interviews, that it was like a, watching a guy in a prize fight with both hands tied behind his back. So fortunately, he was able to understand that and allow me to do what I was able to do. And I think the end result speaks for itself. And I, I do have one other question for you, too. Chris Hayes of Fox 2 KTVI, his reporting, especially on YouTube, is what tipped me off to this case. Uh, he was the only reporter to attend all the hearings, right? That's correct. Um, he, I mean, I remember when he ambushed Pam Hupp outside multiple times before she was eventually arrested. Do you credit him with kind of bringing this case into a more public view, would you say? Uh, what kind of working I, relationship, if at all, do you guys have? I credit him immensely. And I didn't know him before this. Or if I did, it was merely cursory because cursory, we did an interview or two. But uh, we started talking about the case. And he thought it was fascinating, these rulings. And he started covering it. He just couldn't believe what was going on. And this first trial was during sweeps week during November. And that, as we all know, is a big time for TV networks. Mm -hmm. So he got in a huge fight with his producers. He wanted to cover the trial, gavel the gavel, as as they say. And his producers were fighting him saying, what is the big deal? Some guy killed his wife in Troy. Nobody else has any interest in this. We're the only people covering it. What are you doing? Well, I guess all is well that ends well. And the joke was on them. He ended up winning a local Emmy Award for his coverage and a special that he did regarding the case. And we thank him in the book Bone Deep. And Chris has become Mm -hmm. a good friend of mine over the last 10 years. And uh, I do credit him Mm -hmm. with all the publicity. And then uh, what's unfortunate for Chris is when Dateline picked up the story and ran with it, it did so much publicity. And because NBC is doing series, Obviously, and I guess it makes sense that Fox won't allow Chris to participate in any of it. And that's a shame. I I would hope I I would have thought or hope they would made an exception because he was so integrally involved with the story. I mean, he's what put it on my radar. I've seen every single video that that man has produced. And he's an absolutely wonderful journalist. No question. I love Chris. And your interviews with Chris, too. I love like you guys have a a wonderful rapport. We get along very well. Um, And I, I. Chris has been to my house. He's uh, we, we become friends. After the conviction was overturned, do you have any fun anecdotes that you can tell us about Russ's reaction, his response to it? I mean, you were there and you believed in him for so long. I mean, you believed in each other for so long. Do you have any cool little stories with you and Russ? And, you know, Russ was in the penitentiary and I got word to him. You know, you can call down there and they get a message to an inmate to call me. And I called him and I said, have you seen the news? This is after it had been sent back for the trial for a new trial. And he said, Joel, I'm in Jeff City. We don't see the same, we don't have the same news that you have. And I told him, and there was silence. And Russ is not a very emotional guy. I'm I'm the one who gets emotional in this case. In the background, I could hear him crying a little bit and uh, kind of tugged at my heartstrings and I got emotional. 
and that was just the work. Our work wasn't done. That was at the time simply getting ready to get going. Uh, Anecdotally, one of my favorite stories about this, and it sort of encapsulates the ineptitude that we've been speaking of for the past 30 minutes or so. I got the discovery and whenever major case squad is involved, they're pretty thorough. And they were, some of them were very, very thorough in this case with the inexplicable exception of Pam Hub. Mm -hmm. I mean, they investigated, there was a game night individual who is normally there and there's normally six people, meaning the four alibi witnesses, Russ and a sixth person. Well, they investigated that person. They investigated his whereabouts. They went to talk to his boss to make sure he was working that night. They checked him out thoroughly simply to eliminate him as a suspect, which was easy to do. So there are major investigations that go on regarding anyone and everyone involved. So I got the discovery and it was a big stack of it. And I brought it home and I was at my dining room table starting to read through it. And my sweet seventh grade son wanted to help. And I said, sure, sit down and help me. He sat down and he started reading it and I knew he'd get bored within a minute. Well, he, he wasn't bored. He continued to read and he continued to read. 30 minutes later, he looked up at me and he said, dad, I know who did it. It's like, okay. He said, it was that woman, Pam Hub. Oh, wow. That tells you how blatantly obvious yeah. this was. And again, maybe you don't want to make the mistake in that at that point in time and assume she did it, but why do you not? investigate further. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I am the one who subpoenaed her cell site information or forced them to get it. And it showed at the time of the murder, when Betsy was missing phone calls from her daughter, that Pam Hupp was still there. She was still in the home. Yep. Absolutely. Pam Hupp told the police when she made that call, which I've called an alibi call, she told them initially she called Betsy to let, you, let her know she was home. Well, the police followed it up by saying, well, what do you mean you were home? You couldn't have been home. It was too far. And she said, well, I I meant home free. What does that mean? And then she further explained, ultimately, her story changed about six or seven times and finally became, well, after I left, I sat at this intersection waiting for Betsy to call me back because I thought she was angry at me. Now, the only intersection that she could possibly be talking about is a fork in the road. Um, It's pitch black. It is a dark, snowy night in December in St. Louis. Nobody would sit there in the snow, especially when, if you think the person's mad at you, she would have been two or three minutes away from the house. I can't show by cell site that she was still in the house. I can, I can show she was still within the vicinity of the house and quite possibly in the house. I just, I can't fathom why they did not pick up on, if a seventh grader, your son, can pick up on the fact that Pam Hupp did it, right, intuitively speaking, how trained and educated officers, members of law enforcement, forensic analysts and whatnot too, should have been able to spot that right away. It's just mind boggling to me. I really wanted to focus on Russ. I do have a couple questions for you uh, regarding Pam Hupp herself. You know, we're we're about to go into a new phase. Russ Faria is out. He's free. Now it's time for Pam Hupp to face justice, more or less. What were your encounters with her like? Pathologically speaking, what is going on there, Joel? <laughs> like, what is going on there with Pam Hub? It's frustrating because every time I encountered her, she would not only, her story not only changed in the course of time, it would change in the course of an interview. Mm-hmm. For example, prior to this occurring, and this is what I believe, and, and it's a little bit long winded, but we know Betsy changed the beneficiary of Pam, at least that's what the paperwork showed. Well, the question is why? Nobody can answer that. And Betsy's close friends all say the same thing. And that Betsy was going to a meeting with Pam that she didn't want to go to. And she felt pressured. Well, prior to this time, Pam and Betsy had been going door to door collecting money for a woman that Pam Hupp said was a close friend and she was trying to help support her. As it turns out, and Chris Hayes uncovered this, they merely took this woman's Christmas card and we're effectively going door to door and stealing money. And I'm not accusing Betsy of that, but I am accusing Pam because I know Pam would have been behind it. So I asked Pam about it in an interview and she said, well, no, that's not true. We didn't go door to door. I said, well, were you raising money for this woman? And she said, yes, we were. And I said, well, how did you go about raising money? She then said, we went door to door. I looked at her and I said, didn't you just tell me You didn't go door to door. And she said, well, I I forgot, you know, sometimes my brain just doesn't work right. And I have a brain injury. So every lie that she would tell, she would attribute it to this mysterious 
injury she had from her brain to her back, to her drop foot, to her leg. Um, and the police and the prosecutor just brought into it hook, line, and sinker. And I said, get her medical records, force her to turn them over. She wouldn't agree to it. I couldn't get the court to order it. And so I was left with her faking whatever injuries she claimed to have. Uh, so much so that during the course of the trial, when she came in and testified, even though I couldn't cross-examine her, she came in with some sort of device, medical device attached to her belt. So the juries felt sorry for her, felt she was infirmed, and that she couldn't have overpowered Betsy. I remember, th- I remember that. It was crazy. Uh, and then ultimately, it was Dateline's crew. They tried to follow her after a hearing, and she ran up the hill of a parking garage. <laughs> <laughs> it just was the whole thing was nuts. And what you have to remember about Pam is we know she killed Lewis Gumpenberger. Yep. It was a brain damaged individual. She spent some time with him before unloading her firearm into him mercilessly. She's charged with stabbing her best friend or her friend 50 something times. And, 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 you know, in a vacuum, you can talk about it, but when you think about it, the actual act itself to take a knife out and in and continue to plunge it, to attempt to saw off someone's hands. And then to, it was in her, there was about, uh, there was over 10 neck wounds. Mm -hmm. So a knife going into the neck, um, the act it took and the psyche of the individual doing it is beyond something I can understand. And we haven't touched on this at all, but during the course of police interviews, they were trying to, the police were working with Pam, trying to, keep her from being involved and giving her advice as to what to do. And one of the things she volunteered was, you know, I don't understand it. If I needed money, why kill Betsy when my mom is worth half a million dollars that I get when she's, when she's gone. And then she was like, my beer. (laughs) Lo and behold, her mother was found at the base of a three-story apartment complex or residential community. Mm -hmm. Directly after it was it from Pam. Yep. Pam was the last one with her. There were bars or balustrades beneath the balcony that were kicked out uh, that her mother could not have fallen through. And there's been two engineer experiments that proved somebody couldn't fall through there, especially a woman who used a walker and had 14 times the recommended dose of Ambien in her. Mm -hmm. So if we are to assume that Pam was responsible for that, which I think many people have assumed, Mm -hmm. she would have to take her mother, roll her to the edge of this balcony and then force her through this railing. The actual act of doing that to a human being, much less your mother, gives you some sort of insight into the person that we're dealing with. Again, assuming that that's what occurred, which I think is a fair assumption. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I believe the statistic uh, for the last time I checked a couple months ago with the FBI statistics is that women typically when they murder, it's via something very hands-off, right? Impersonal poison, something like that, even guns. To take a a weapon, a knife, and plunge it into someone is usually only seen in very emotional, close, and personal killings. To do that to her supposed best friend, and then like you said, allegedly, which we know that she did, and then Louis Gumpenberger, uh, God, I mean, she picked him up and then took him to her home, staged all of it in this elaborate plan, a man who had mental disabilities. I cannot imagine what kind of psychological pathology we are dealing with here. I have often said, if I knew then what I know now, I'm not a firearms guy. I've never owned a gun, but I would have carried a gun with me at all times. I would have answered my door with a gun because knowing what I know now regarding her, um, she's capable of anything. She certainly would have been capable of showing up. The two people she hated most were me and Chris Hayes. She used to call him mini me or mini Joel Jr. Um, I just couldn't get over the brazenness. When I released her from a subpoena in that second trial, she sent back a text to my associate, Nate Swanson, saying, what's the matter? Schwartz loses balls. Wow. Uh, yeah. Talk about brazen. Couldn't believe it. And then her uh, her dramatic, um, her theatrics in the police station when they finally you know, brought her in for questioning and then she stabbed herself in the neck with a pen. She, yeah, like, she did. <laughs> um, I've often said that was a that was staged. If she wanted to stab herself, she's really good at stabbing. <laughs> she's made that very clear. Oh, she has. And and all the details, you know, what, what's interesting to me is before writing Bone Deep, um, I thought, wow, there's so much publicity regarding this case. Mm-hmm. 
it's so saturated. Who wants to hear about this? And Charles Bosworth and I wrote it. And the reviews we're getting back, especially from the people who say, you know what? I watched all the Dateline episodes. I watched, I've listened to the podcast. Mm -hmm. I thought Mm -hmm. I knew about this case. But then they read about the cross-examinations and the limitations that we were, uh, the areas we were prohibited from going to. It's really, really astounding to me and complimentary where people are coming back and saying, I just can't imagine that this actually went on and what you endured. Um, So it's something where I'm proud of the results and I'm really happy that people are enjoying what they're doing. No, and thank you so much for writing this book. I was too often you see either attorneys or family members write books that come out of cases and tragedies like these. And it appears very self-serving, right? In your case, not at all. And I very much appreciate what you've done, the time that you've spent. You know, it's very clear that you recognize the problems in the justice system and the legal system, and you are bringing light to those. And Joel, you have co-written a fantastic book here, and I wish you the absolute most success. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I mean, you saved a man's life. You kept a man who was wrongfully convicted from living out a life sentence and dying in prison. Well, Robin, I can't thank you enough. And everything in it is verbatim. It's from transcripts. It's from everything there was written, either what was in my brain or it was simply on paper. And and I am glad that people are enjoying it. And I'm glad that we were able to make this frightening story at least entertaining and people can read through the book. I do have a Patreon and I actually open up all of my guest interviews to our patrons and I got two questions back from them that people want to know and they want me to ask you. Um, The first one, we have to ask the thing about Pam, NBC's upcoming show uh, starring Renee Zellweger as Pam Hop. So when you were approached about the show, were you skeptical? Were you excited for this? And also how excited are you to be played by Josh Duhamel? Well, um, when they told me Renee Zellweger, was going to be the producer. I was incredibly excited given her talent and given her attention to detail and everyone who I've met who's involved. You know, I went to New York and I met with the uh, the Dateline producers and the NBC News people behind it. Um, I spent a bunch of time with the with Keith Morrison and, and Kathy Singer who were behind the Dateline and that was all that was going into it. So I was incredibly, I, I, I'm still excited <laughs> I, and I've, I've gotten to go down. I, I do have a cameo in the TV series, which is a lot of fun. Nice. Um, but then they came up and they said Judy Greer was going to play the prosecutor. And Judy Greer is one of those people who I will say this, I'm almost ashamed. I didn't know her by name, but you look up Judy Greer and I I don't think there's been <laughs> one individual, and I probably said it to 50, who look her up and go, Oh my God, she's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, frankly, most people know of her. I didn't, but I got to spend some time with her, and she is incredible. And the scene that I do with her is she's she's amazing. And she's spending the whole scene cutting down Joel Schwartz, which is really fun. <laughs> um, and Josh, what I can say is the big question was who's going to play me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm humbled by all this. And I, nobody's really ever called me a humble guy. I'm confident. And I have a bit of an ego. But you know, I had no idea who they were going to come up with. And every single person I knew from my wife to my kids to all my friends were throwing out this name and that name. And they came to me and they said, all right, we've got a guy and it's Josh Dumal. And for a moment, I was like, okay, who's Josh Dumal? Oh, Josh Dumal. He's wonderful. And he's done, you know, from what the stuff I've seen, he's done a great job. Um, we've gotten to be friends. We communicate with one another. And apparently he's very happy with what he's seen so far because they have not, I have not seen any of the movie. I just, they consulted with me. I I met every week with all the writers, but I have not been uh, fortunate enough to view any of it. So hopefully it's entertaining. Uh, The promos have been interesting to say the least. Amazing. Given given Renee and Josh and uh, the writer, Jenny Klein, I I think it's going to be incredible. Looking forward to it. I hope it doesn't get the total Hollywood treatment and remains true to and factual to a lot of the case. Well, they certainly spent a lot of time getting the facts. Oh, that's that's a positive sign. Yeah, so it's a good sign. Speaking to my listeners, guys, this is the perfect time. Pick up Bone Deep. It just dropped yesterday on the 22nd. Read the book, and then you can get all of the behind-the-scenes details, understand what's going through Joel's head, understand the case as a whole before rolling into the Thing About Pam TV show on March 8th. 
Perfect. And Robin, thank you so much. And I hope uh, your listeners enjoy the, the book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today, Joel. Oh, thank you. Joel's book is called Bone Deep, Untangling the Twisted True Story of the Tragic Betsy Faria Murder Case. And guys, Joel and his publishing company, they were kind enough to give me an advanced copy of this three months ago, actually. Like I said earlier in the beginning of this episode, this interview had been in the works for a couple months since Christmas, since the holidays. I've read it twice. It's riveting. It's emotional. Multiple times I wanted to cry. Joel does an incredible job of really bringing you into the psyche of what it's like to be him. Stories about Russ, what it's like to witness such ineptitude, corruption, and a sinister system at play who just merely wants to convict a man for for the W versus actually getting to the bottom of it and getting to the truth and, and letting justice prevail. Purchase this book. Reach out to us. I want to know what you think. This is one, guys, that really, 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 really deserves your time. Just as much, if not more, than most true crime documentaries that you're going to, pro- I mean, let's face it, you're going to waste your time watching anyway, right? It's absolutely incredible. And not only that, but don't forget, if you get it now, you can finish it before The Thing About Pam on March 8th, which we are going to have a massive watch party over here at We Saw the Devil for that, not only to see Jules cameo, but also in preparation for, guys, Pam Hop still hasn't had her murder trial yet. As we discussed in this episode, in the, in, in the interview with, uh, with Joel, she murdered a man by the name of Louis Gumpenberger. Again, please check out the previous series that I did on the case if you haven't. She already knowingly murdered one man. She possibly murdered her own mother. And then she also murdered Betsy Faria. So that's three probable murders at Pam Hupp's hands. And she's about to go to trial, which, by the way, is a death penalty case. They are, in fact, seeking the death penalty against her. This podcast is going to be covering it gavel to gavel, as Joel described. And I'm really, really excited to see this horrible, horrible, horrible human being face justice, which is what we've all been waiting for for years now in this case. So thanks again for listening. Again, you can find us at www.wesawthedevil.com. From there, you can find all of our social media accounts as well as our Patreon. If you're digging the show, you like this interview, and you want to financially back the show, go ahead, do so now, patreon.com forward slash wesawthedevil. We'd love to have you be part of the team. Until next crime.